All right, now let's continue with visualization analysis and design by talking about data abstractions. So what does data mean? Well, it depends. For example, here's a sequence of six numbers, 14, 2.6, 30, 30, 15, 100,001. What should we interpret this to be? Is it two points, two triplets far from each other in three-dimensional space where we have three numbers for each? Is it two points close to each other in 2D space, 14, 2, 30, 30, with 15 links in between them, and that, wink, that link has a weight of 100,001? Um, does it mean something else? If all we know are these six numbers, we, we can't know. You know, here's another example. It's not just mysteries about numbers. You know, basil, seven, S, pear. What does that mean? You know, I could imagine things. Maybe it's a food shipment of produce, basil and pears. They arrived in satisfactory condition on the seventh day of the month. Maybe it's the Basel Point neighborhood of the city. There were seven inches of snow. They were cleared by Pear Creek Limited Snow Removal Service. Maybe I had a lab rat codenamed Basil. It took seven attempts for him to find his way through the south section of the maze. And the reward food we used in those trials was a pear. So when we have data, we need some sort of semantics that we attach to it, some sort of real world meaning that we need to use in the context of how to visually show that data. We need to know what it means. So the meaning of this data. For example, here we now see some other, uh, not just Basel 7 S pair, but more. And we can already start to sort of guess, oh, I think I start to see what this data might mean simply from the rest of the context. So in this case, um, I'm positing a data set where we have names and ages and shirt size and favorite fruits. Okay, that once we know that, that's knowledge we would need to have, you know, externally to the data itself. Sometimes we call these metadata, although one person's metadata is another person's data. So I'm just going to stick with calling this uh, semantics. Um, so when you think about the type of data, it's some sort of structural or semantic or interpretation of the underlying meaning of that data. And over the course of this segment, we're going to talk about things like items and links and attributes and spatial positions and uh, even grids. Um, but the part I want you to note is I don't mean the same thing here by data type that we might mean in a programming language where we have types like integers or floats. Um, I mean, sometimes there's a, a mapping of these data types to those, but, but often there is not. So I don't mean the programming data types. I mean the semantics of what particular uh, entries in some uh, data file, what they mean. So I'm going to use the vocabulary of items and attributes. So by item, I mean an individual entity. It's something that's discrete uh, rather than continuous. So like a patient in a hospital, a car, uh, a stock of a company, you know, a city. Those of you who have a stats background might think of these as independent variables. So in this case, my item, which is one of these uh, table rows, well, clearly that seems to be a person. Now an attribute we're gonna think of as something that is a property of an item. Maybe you measure it, simulate it, observe it, log it. So if you had a patient as an item, you could have attributes like height and blood pressure. If your car is an item, you could have attributes like horsepower and make. Those of you from stats background will think of this as a dependent variable. So in our data set, our attributes are simply these columns, which we have named already. There's other kinds of data. For example, a link is a way to express a relationship between two items, like uh, friends on Facebook or proteins that interact with each other within a cell uh, due to gene activity. Um, so for positions, I actually do mean spatial positions, locations in two-dimensional space or three-dimensional space. Uh, it could be the location of a pixel within a photograph in 2D. It could be the voxels in an MRI scan if you have 3D medical imaging data. If you've got geographic data, that could be latitude and longitude. So this is intrinsically spatial uh, position data or grids as a sampling strategy for continuous data as we'll get to in just a minute. So one of the major data set types, not just data types, but data set types is tabular data. So we've, we've thought about data types. Now let's think about what's an entire data set. And in visualization, uh, the way I like to think about it is there's three major data set types and 
The big one is tables. So we'll start out with a simple flat table like we have here. There's one item uh, per row and each column is an attribute. And then we can think of a cell in a table as having some value for that pair of items and attributes. I'll note that there um, sometimes with flat tables, you don't have explicit keys. They could be implicit, but some sort of unique key so you can actually look up a particular item. Of course, names are typically not the safest thing to assume uh, as a unique key. So in this case, if we were getting a larger table, at some point we might have a, a person ID. Let's look at an example from some real world data here, uh, thanks to Mariah Meyer. So this data, we've got item. Right. Notice how, in fact, our order ID doesn't even give us that's not a there could be multiple items per order. So none of these is unique. Um, but we've got an item going across. We've got an attribute in this case, product container and the intersection for this item of this attribute. In this case, a cell in that table is medium box. Now, tables don't have to be simple. Instead of a flat table, you could have a multidimensional table. And that's where we have more than one key. And this idea is familiar to any of you who have used multidimensional arrays in a programming context. You have to look up more than one key to actually get to the thing you're doing. So here's an example of we could have a key of both the gene and the patient. And to get a particular value of the gene expression level, it's indexed on both gene and patient. So it's a multidimensional table. The world is not just tables. What about networks? Sometimes these are called graphs. Um, so in a network, we're going to distinguish, instead of just saying that we've got items, we're going to distinguish nodes, sometimes called vertices, from links, sometimes called edges. And uh, networks are the general case. A special case of a network is a tree. Um, and uh, trees don't have cycles. Uh, often they have roots and typically they're directed so that you've got the parent and then the child relationship. So they can explicitly express hierarchies um, in a way that you aren't necessarily given in that more general context of a network. Um, although often these are called graphs, um, I'm not going to call them graphs just because of the confusion that sometimes people also use the word graph to mean chart. So to, dis to disambiguate, I'm usually going to talk about networks versus chart, a visual de depiction of data. Uh, because that word graph is so ambiguous. Although graph drawing is what a lot of people call this area of network visualization. And actually, before we go on to spatial data, let me point out one more thing, which is that attributes for tabular data, we thought, well, there's items and there's attributes. In a network context, the attributes could either be attached to the nodes or to the links, or of course, to both. So you can distinguish between node attributes and link attributes with uh, network data sets. OK, so now let's go on to spatial data. So first of all, let's think about spatial fields. And that's where what we're doing is we're thinking of something that is continuous that we are sampling explicitly at different points in space. And that's why we need this idea of a grid of positions at which we take these samples. Um, and then at each one of these uh, cells in the grid, we can actually get these attributes, whether they're measured, simulated, observed. So we have, notice how we continue to have this idea that there's attributes, but in this case, these attributes are tied to specific spatial locations or regions. So this idea that we have cells that contain values from some sort of continuous spatial domain, you know, here's a geographic example we've got, we could sample temperature or pressure or wind velocity at these different uh, regions of space. Um, and another example that might also be familiar to you instead of uh, is a 3D example of medical imaging where we have a volume of space in which we are taking these sample points. Um, and so the major concerns with this sort of continuous spatial field uh, data collection is that we have to worry about both sampling and interpolation. And sampling is thinking about where we're measuring these attributes. And interpolation is how you would impute a value um, between sample points. So you might want to read out things that are not exactly what you put in. How do we actually worry about uh, the mathematics of sampling and interpolation are a major concern with this kind of spatial data. And there's a whole field of signal processing which gets into the mathematics of how we do this. Uh, 
And the other thing we also need to think about is, you know, what type of grid do we have? Where do we do these samples? How do we store them? Are they implicit or explicit? Um, and that's another major concern when we get to the visualization of this kind of data. Uh, is it a rectilinear grid, a curvilinear grid? Is it regularly sampled or irregularly sampled? Um, so these issues all come to the fore um, as we then think about how to visualize that data. So the major divisions in spatial fields uh, are according to how many attributes per cell are we dealing with. So if we just have one attribute per cell, we're going to call that scalar spatial fields. Uh, medical imaging is a very common uh, example of that. But we could have more than one. What if we have two attributes per cell? We think of these as vector fields, uh, where we actually can think about things like you know, direction and then we can get magnitude both. We think about these things. Sometimes we could visualize them with arrows. There's many other ways as well. In this snippet, we're not really focusing on how we visually represent it, but what is it that we are representing at all? And then finally, if you have multiple values per cell, uh, we think of this as tensor data, where you have a lot of attributes. And again, we'll get into the visual encoding of this later on. Right now, we're just thinking about data types and data set types. And then finally, while we're thinking about spatial data, we need to think about geometric information that is intrinsic to spatial data. So we might just know some geometry. So we have spatial positions. Um, and so let's think about what that means. We might actually have the shape of things. Geographic data is a very classic example of this, right? There's the boundaries of this, the, the in this case, the US shapes or the boundaries of different regions of uh, uh, the same height on this geographic map here. So we have explicit information about spatial positions or spatial regions, whether that's points or curves or surfaces or volumes. And it's worth bringing up a specific point, which is what's the boundary between computer graphics and visualization? Because after all, suddenly we're talking about, you know, we've got geometric data and we're making pictures of it. Isn't that just what computer graphics is? And my distinction between them is in graphics, the geometry you take as given, it is given to you, and then you have the problem of how to actually render uh, that geometric information according to some sort of uh, synthetic idea of where the cameras and the lights are. In visualization, we do worry about drawing that picture, which is equivalent to rendering in graphics. But the key point is that the geometry is the result of a design decision by the visualization designer. So we could, for example, take one geometry in and then make choices about things of how to abstract that. So when we're thinking about data abstractions, we are given geometry in some cases, or we might compute it, and then we might choose to abstract that geometry depending on the task that we're dealing with. So we're almost done. We've got those three major data types, which are tables and networks and spatial data, but there's also uh, some ideas of what if we have some sort of collection of items, clusters or sets or lists. So collection is some sort of grouping of items. It could be a set where the items are unique and we don't have any sort of intrinsic ordering uh, within that set. It could be a list where things are ordered. It is possible to have something appear in a list more than once. You could have duplicates. Uh, clusters, where you have some sort of group of similar items, and the question of exactly what you count as similarity and how you create those clusters is a whole uh, field in and of itself. And often what we're going to do in visualization is think that if we are given a cluster, how do we actually then visualize it? So we've now seen that we had a lot of these data types and data set types, and notice how we had these um, data types as these elements that we saw inside of many of the data set type. So we have items and attributes. Those are the big ones. We can have uh, links, a uh, particular uh, special case of items as links between them. We can have spatial positions. And we can then also have this idea of a grid in which we're sampling spatial data. So let's go back to attributes, because there's a really crucial question we need to wrestle with here, which is, what is going on with attribute types? That is, which classes of values and measurements are we dealing with here? And the really major distinction is between categorical and ordered attributes. So categorical attribute type, sometimes people call that nominal uh, or even qualitative. So the idea is you can compare equality. You know it is in the category or it is not in the category. 
but there's no ordering implicitly whatsoever. In contrast, we could have ordered data where there is an ordering. Um, and in some cases that might just be what we'll call ordinal data, which is something is you know, less than or greater than. So the example we're seeing here visually is t-shirts. You can know that a medium t-shirt is between a small and a large, but you can't do arithmetic on it. You can't say what's a large t-shirt minus a small t-shirt. On the other hand, for quantitative data, you do have magnitudes that have uh, defined semantics and you can actually do arithmetic and you can talk about things like, you know, what is the height of this pencil minus the height of this pen? That is a defined quantity. So you can do that kind of arithmetic. So let's go back to that table example. So we've got categorical and ordinal and quantitative. And so let's think about what some of the easy ones are. All right, quantitative, those are the numbers, right? The red things, those are things we can really think of as numbers. You could do arithmetic on them. Now, ordinal, right? It seems clear that we can have the medium boxes in between small and large. So we could probably have an ordering of all these box types. I bet jumbo is the biggest. Um, but it's not sort of easy to define what, what's jumbo minus large, right? Not a, not a defined quantity. And then, interesting judgment call, should we think of this order ID as a quantitative number? Probably doesn't make sense to do arithmetic on it. It doesn't make sense to talk about order 134 minus order three. So we don't want to consider it quantitative. Maybe in some cases we might consider it ordinal, um, but in many cases, we just really want to use this as a distinction. It is in, it is this order ID number or it is not. So there was a bit of a judgment call about thinking about uh, whether this one was categorical. So in addition to this question of what's the attribute type, categorical versus the two kinds of ordered, there's also, well, is there a direction? If it's ordered, do we just have a quantity that goes from min to max for sequential? Or do we want to think that there's some zero point and things go down and up from the zero point? So is it diverging? Now, what's crucial is from a mathematical point of view, you could transform one to the other. But we're not just talking about the mathematics, we're talking about the semantics. How do people think about it? How do they reason about it? And that's why we want to make that distinction so that later when we talk about visual encodings, we can have a representation of it that gets people perceptually thinking along these lines. Now, in addition, there could be cyclic data, right? Things could actually wrap around. So it doesn't just have to be min and going to maybe infinite uh, positive values. Some classic examples of things that wrap around are seasonal data, um, so um, any sort of temporal structure like that, uh, or you know the direction of the wind. So there is a way to think about data that intrinsically has cycles. And then finally, there's this question of, is the data set available? Um, is it static? Are you given the entire data set all at once? Or is it streaming data? Is it dynamic data where it is not available to you at the beginning, it's going to be streaming in as you are working with that data. So it's sometimes useful to distinguish between static and dynamic data. So we've been talking about ways of having a data, uh, different kinds of semantics of data. And now let's talk about this idea that sometimes we need to abstract the data. What we need to do is we need to translate from domain specific language into some generic language of visualization. And everything I've been walking through with you has been introducing a particular generic vocabulary visualization for talking about data with. So let's say that you're faced with a data set. What do you do? Um, well, the absolute basic place to start is figure out the types. What is the data set type? And what are the attribute types? So is it tabular? Is it network? Is it spatial? Um, Often you'll get something that's maybe a more complex data set, for example, text data, uh, where it is then transformed into one of these other three basic data set types. And think about the attribute types. Are they categorical or ordinal or quantitative? It's a fundamental thing you want to understand. And then what is the cardinality? How many items are there in the data set? Are there 10? Are there 10 million? Are there 10,000? And the reason we think about this is it is going to affect your reasonable choices for how to visually encode that data. So when we're dealing with visualization data in this abstraction context, we want to understand how much. So we need to know how many items in the data set. And for every attribute, what's the cardinality? That is, how many unique levels are there? 
if it's fruit, right? Are there just apples and bananas or are there apples and bananas and kiwis and grapefruit and you know lychee and so on? So how many unique levels are there in, for categorical attributes? And for quantitative data, what's the range typically from a, a min to max, um, if it's sequential or from you know, a negative value uh, through some zero point to a positive value if it is diverging. So armed with that just basic information, your concern as a visualization designer is then, do I need to transform this data? Can I take it as it is given or do I need to transform it to derive some other kind of data such that if I drew that picture, I would actually help the user. And so that consideration must be guided by understanding the task. This is why task and data are both together uh, in terms of the abstraction level. There is a strong relationship between them. So what, what do I mean by transform the data? How or why might you transform it? So let's, let's take as an example, um, data versus a conceptual model, right? So a data model, if you're familiar with something like databases, you know, you might have thought of this, or if you're thinking about it from a programming context, a data model is some sort of mathematical abstraction. So, you know, you can think of things like sets with operations, like you can have floating point numbers and you can say, well, what's defined is multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. That's a very mathematical way to think about the data. Or you might have that programming language data type we talked about before, right? You might have some idea of, okay, this is a programming language data type. But in contrast, in visualization, we're really concerned with a conceptual model in a person's head, right? What is the mental construction people have when they think about this data set? I'll often use the word semantics for that. And the idea is we need to support human reasoning. And so that's going to be based on some sort of understanding of tasks. Stay tuned, that's gonna be in our next snippet. Um, and so the data abstraction process really relies on a conceptual model for transforming data for the situations where that's needed. So let's look at an example. Say that we've got some data model where you've got floating point numbers, right? Negative, you know, 32.52, 54.06, negative 14.35. What do I do with these? Well, it depends on my conceptual model. Let's say that this is temperature data. Okay, now what kind of data abstractions should I use for this? And the answer is, it's gonna depend on the task. Say that we actually have some task like forecasting the weather. In that case, let's leave this as you know quantitative data. We, we think of this as some sort of continuous property. We're measuring it to two significant figures, but that's not the only thing we could do. Let's say all we need to know is, is it hot or is it warm or is it cold? Well, we've just taken this complexity of the quantitative data and binned it down into something ordinal because all I'm trying to do is figure out is the bath water ready? You know, hot, cold, lukewarm. I don't need to know whether it's, you know, 26.7 degrees or 106.2. Or what if I could even go further down, like what if I just want to go all the way down to something categorical, it's above freezing, it's below freezing, because I'm trying to decide if I should leave the house, and if so, you know, how should I dress? Um, I just want to know above or below. So this idea that we could take data as input and then do some sort of transformation of it, um, let's formally talk about this as this idea of deriving data. So we could not just take the attributes we're given, we could derive new attributes where we do some computation from that original data. And it might be a simple change of type, like we have just talked about in that previous example. It could be that we acquire additional data, um, but it could be that what we wanna do is transform the data we have to some other more useful format. So here's an example that dates all the way back to the invention of the line chart by William Playfair in the 18th century. Um, and he was looking at the imports versus the exports versus the imports, in this case, the balance of trade for Britain. Now, in the original data set, you know, one his great invention was that you could actually use a line chart. There was a time when this was a new idea. But what I want you to notice is it's great to have a line chart instead of just staring at a table of numbers. But there's actually still a fair amount of cognitive and perceptual activity going on to understand the difference between those. Um, you actually have to look at a bunch of different points, sort of do a mental comparison and try to store in your mind um, 
what that looks like. If instead, and people tend to make systematic errors, they actually tend to, um, instead of looking straight up and down, they tend to sort of find the shortest paths between these lines, which is actually not the correct interpretation of it. So it can be a challenging perceptual and cognitive task to figure out the balance of trade. If you actually did the arithmetic where you simply took one of these um, attributes and subtracted the other from it, you would get the trade balance and you could plot that directly. And so in that case, balance of trade is a derived attribute that you could get from your original data, which was exports and imports. So that's a simple example of how doing some sort of der data derivation can reduce the cognitive burden on the human looking at this. Let's take a slightly more complex example um, that's not just a local computation, but actually is a global computation. Here's an example of computing a centrality metric. This is a way of measuring how um, central or you know, crucial or important some sort of node is in a network or a tree. And so this is uh, one of many possible um, centrality metrics. And the point here is that it's derived. It is a derived quantitative attribute where what the, 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 um, the idea of why we would bother to compute this in this case was to say, hey, what if I have a half a million nodes in a graph and I only have time to draw 5,000 of them because say we're doing a, uh, the user's moving their mouse and I need to update quickly. Well, if we just took the first 5,000 in the data set, we'd probably get that upper um, left-hand corner that's all red there. That's not gonna be very useful. What if we wanna find just the top 5,000 ones from the point of view of really describing the structure of this tree? So thinking about this in terms of a chained series of tasks, you first wanna derive data so that then you could actually visually encode the data. So in this case, there's actually a computation that requires globally looking at the entire structure. You're not just comparing um, you know, one node at a time, you're doing a global computation and you're coming up with this derived attribute um, on the nodes in the graph. And then we could go through and do some sort of a filter to filter out the low values and then just draw this skeleton of the tree in a way that's comprehensible. So we've gone through and thought about what uh, data we have. So thought about the data abstractions, we've described an independent domain, uh, a domain independent sort of uh, visualization oriented vocabulary for thinking about data sets and attributes and their types. And so that will let us now talk about this in all of our subsequent discussions of visualization.